started. Tonight we are going to be talking about beneficial insects in the Florida vegetable garden. Uh, this is a really important um, concept in organic and sustainable gardening um, and it's one that is um, can be maybe a little bit um, confusing or frustrating just because um, in the beginning it could, can be difficult to realize what um, is good and what is bad. Um, so we're going to be going through that um, tonight so that hopefully you have a really good understanding of the main pests. Um, but since there are so many new faces um, today, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Elise Pickett and I am the owner of the Urban Harvest. I teach Floridians um, how to vegetable garden here in Florida. And just a little bit about me, since we're talking about um, insects, I figured I'd share, I'd try to share a little something different every time, um, just for those who are taking classes that already know me. Um, I got my degree in wildlife ecology and conservation with a minor in zoology. And part of that was taking entomology, which is the study of insects, one of my classes. And we had to do this, um, I was not that into bugs really, um, but we had to do this board where we pinned all of the dead bugs and identified them properly and everything. I can't remember how many it was, like maybe 50 or 100 different insects that we collected ourselves. And I was doing this project for school and I ended up catching a praying mantis and he was so cool and chill and I loved him and I didn't want to have to kill him so I asked my teacher if I could just take a picture and do that instead because I didn't want to I didn't want to put pin him to a board and she was cool with it so um I ended up with a praying mantis and a little um a little bug you know for like little kids or whatever I kept him for a few weeks and then let him go but um it just showed me how cool bugs are. He, that little thing was awesome and I'd catch little bugs and put them in there and to watch him catch it and everything was really, really fun. Um, so anyhow, just a little tidbit about uh, some of my schooling and background, all sorts of kooky things that most people don't get to uh, <laughs> learn about in school, but uh, that's what you get when you're a wildlife biologist. So, all right. Um, I always like to start my talks um, with a quote. And tonight it's going to be adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. And that's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I think it is especially fitting when we're talking about good bugs. We were already referencing that earlier. A few people had questions and she said, um, one of the um, women had asked about a bug and how long she should wait until it's in her garden um, to take care of the, the bad bugs. Uh, naturally. And um, patience is a virtue uh, that uh, everybody, I think, um, is constantly working on. So the more patient we can be, uh, the um, more results that you'll see. So um, why bother learning the good bugs? Why not just spray the garden or the flowers or the yard? and just be done with it. Why bother um, using organic techniques? Why bother looking for the good bugs and trying to help support them? Um, and there's a lot of reasons. Uh, the most obvious is that we are hopefully um, greatly reducing, if not eliminating, the use of pesticides. And regardless of whether they're organic or not, pesticides are pesticides. Um, it kills things and um, it can it can have buildup in your soil. It can affect the environment through runoff. It certainly clearly affects the wildlife and the, the living organisms in your environment. It can potentially alter your soil ecosystem. There's a lot of bacteria and good things in your soil. Um, and when we're using pesticides, that can alter the soil, which can affect nutrient uptake, water absorption from your plants. Um, the list goes on, uh, not to mention that they could potentially even impact our own health. Um, so the less that we need to use those, the better. Um, so the other thing that's really important to understand is when we do choose to use a pesticide, 
99.9% .9 of the time, it is not going to kill all of the insects. And just like we have superbugs in the hospital, um, we can get superbugs in the garden. And that's what we've been seeing um, through the widespread use of Roundup and a lot of these other really strong pesticides. The ones that do survive, the bugs that do survive are naturally capable of handling these pesticides. So the next time it takes an even more toxic pesticide and it just goes on from there. Um, we never get them all. And then we have an even bigger problem on our hands. Um, so it is really important to, to use pesticides very judiciously and um, minimally. And when we set our system up for success, we're gonna be talking a little bit about offense versus defense as well as the natural bugs um, and integrative pest management. Um, I'll explain all of that in just a little bit. But when we set ourselves up for success, um, it's gonna take less work on your part. You're not gonna to have to go out there and spray after every rain. You're not gonna to have to um, constantly be perusing the garden looking for the bad bugs. Um, when we set things up properly, nature takes care of it for us. All right. So um, one of those terms that I threw out um, is a little bit sciencey. Integrative pest management, um, also known as IPM. And it's a pretty key um, organic agriculture um, and sustainable agriculture approach. Um, and it basically just means working with nature and trying to do a whole lot of offensive work versus defensive work. Um, so it takes, um, we're gonna go into exactly what it inquires, but definitely the planning and planting. So it doesn't start once um, you're starting to get fruit or once you see the bugs, it starts when you're planning your seasons and everything like that. So a lot of planning goes into integrated pest management. And then um, once your plants are in the ground, you're going to be doing monitoring, regular monitoring, so that things don't get too out of hand. Um, we try to let nature do its job, but um, we want to be there making sure things are kind of kept in balance so that if we need to tweak a little bit here and there, it's easier to tweak rather than have to, you know, throw a bomb in the garden <laughs> um, when things are under control versus out of control. Um, and then the last step is the most important and it's decision making. So it can be really frustrating when you walk out to your garden and you see your beans covered in aphids. Like I feel you, I've been doing this for years and every time I go out, it still is like, oh my goodness, um, what do I do, you know? Um, but instead of just reacting, um, it's taking the time to make a decision um, look at the environmental factors, take a look around the garden, see if you notice any beneficial insects nearby, um, considering the least um, toxic method to achieve your results. Um, so integrative pest management is definitely a key principle um, when you're looking at organic and sustainable vegetable gardening. So um, as far as the offense versus the defense, there are a lot of things that we can do to set our garden up for success. And I've taught a bunch of other classes. I have um, YouTube videos. I do weekly um, YouTube videos all on Florida-based vegetable gardening. Um, and there are tutorials covering, you know, anything from how to plant a tomato from seed to um, this bug just ate my squash um, and everything in between. Um, so there's a lot of different concepts that you can implement in the garden that will help set you up for success. Um, one of those is planting flowers. Um, they're not just for beauty, um, they're also really good for most of the insects that we're going to be talking about. A lot of them are carnivores, um, but really they're omnivores or at different life stages they eat different things. Um, so in general flowers um, are really important to have around um, so that they can get nectar and pollen. Um, having vegetation nearby, um, so a lot of times we try to create a fairly sterile environment in the garden and that's the opposite of what nature is. Um, if you think about, you know, the forest floor or the meadow, um, it is anything but um, sterile. <laughs> so creating different textures um, and levels within the landscape, maybe nearby you have um, 
shrubs at a couple of different heights, maybe some ground cover. Ground cover is really important for a lot of these different insects, beneficial insects. So keeping that in mind and building that in and around the garden. Um, a lot of people also choose, and this is kind of in that, that same vein, but um, they'll have sacrifice plants, plants that are really attractive to aphids planted near the garden, so that instead of going to the prized plants, they go to the sacrifice plants. Um, you can also offer habitat and shelter for the good guys. Um, this could be a sandy patch in the soil, a brush pile, or even um, different homes. So a bat box, technically bats are voracious insectivores. Um, they eat bugs all the time. So maybe a bat house, or if you've ever seen the solitary bee homes where they have the bunch of tubes and like almost looks like a little bird box. Um, so offering them shelter in homes is a really helpful way to make sure that they're already in the environment um, before the predator or the, before the pests show up. Um, also having water sources around, things like stacked rocks, um, they catch condensation, so they're able to get it from there. Um, perhaps having a um, fountain or a pond or even um, just a bird bath. Um, depending on the insect, you may have to have, the bird baths don't always work well because they're usually steeper sided, um, but depending on the, the bird bath, it could potentially function as that in the garden. Um, and one of the most important things, and I talk about this a lot, um, I do have a video on um, knowing your seasons. I'll send you a link for that. Um, and choosing the right varieties to plant in your garden according to the season. But when plants are stressed, they are much, much more likely to uh, not be able to fight off pests. So if there are, if there are heat stressed or they prefer cool weather or they don't like heavy rains, if they're out of their elements, they're already going to be just like us. You know, when we get worn out, we're more likely to get sick. If we're, you know, running low on sleep or not eating well, we're more likely to get sick. It's the same with plants. So when we set them up and pick the right plants in the right place and give them the things they need to thrive, they're going to be able to fight off pests much, much better. Um, than if they were out of place. All right, so um, I did see a question. I'll pause here and hop on over. If anybody else does have any um, questions, go ahead and type those in now. Um, so Miriam asked, can you give examples of good plants to use as sacrifice plants? Um, yeah, so it depends. Um, aphids are a really common one um, in the garden here as a pest. Um, there's a lot of other potential issues, but um, those are a really common ones. So sunflowers are really, really attractive to aphids. Um, so you could potentially do sunflowers in and around the garden. Um, different flowers definitely draw them in. Um, another way you can look at it is having literally the plant they like, but just in a big patch that's separate from the main part of the garden that you would like. Um, so a lot of people, um, the black swallowtail butterfly loves, clearly it's a beautiful butterfly and a great pollinator and um, a species that we'd all love to support, but they like um, anything in the carrot family. So they love dill and parsley and carrots and all of that. And they can completely wipe you out if enough of them get, enough of the eggs get laid on them. So what a lot of people will do is um, seed a large patch of dill, which is also great for drawing in pollinators um, and beneficial insects. And they'll have that huge patch. And then that way, whenever they find the caterpillars on their main garden, they'll just try, they'll just move them over to the sacrifice patch. Um, so it can be taken in multiple ways as far as what a sacrifice plant actually is. Um, all right, Hillary asked, the city county is spraying on my street for mosquitoes this week. How harmful is that stuff to beneficial insects and pollinators? Uh, it's not great. Uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of things I think that get kind of just slipped under the radar and it takes time and effort to get things changed and um, a lot of that they'll do um, like BT which is a bacteria that only affects 
um, certain insects, but all of that has a chain reaction, um, in my opinion. And regardless of how it affects the beneficial insects, it's gonna affect things that eat the mosquitoes. Um, so the bats. Um, and there are beneficial insects that actually eat mosquitoes as well. We'll talk about that tonight. So, I mean, it's not great, but um, unfortunately living in an urban setting, we don't really have much control over that. So, um, all right. So, um, Alina asked on a similar note, are there any targeted ways to control mosquitoes without impacting other insects? Um, yeah, so if I prefer to use repellents on myself, um, rather than trying to eliminate them from the yard, which is pretty much never going to happen. It would be, in Florida, the longest, hardest battle of your life. <laughs> uh, we have too much moisture. There's too many. They can, they can lay eggs in literally like millimeters of water. So even if you're turning over your pots, they're going to find somewhere. You're never going to get rid of all the mosquitoes in your yard. Um, so to me, I'd rather use, I was actually... <laughs> I was talking to some of the folks that logged in earlier. This is a um, beautyberry leaf. Um, the Native Americans um, in Florida, the Seminole Indian tribe, uh, used to use this as an insect repellent. You take a leaf, you rub it on your skin, um, unless you're really susceptible, like that's not 100%. My mom's really susceptible to getting chewed up by mosquitoes. It doesn't work for her, but it seems to do a job just fine for me. Um, and there's other repellents that you can apply that are safe and non-toxic to you. Lemongrass is a really good one. Um, so um, that's my approach at least. Um, okay, so um, I am gonna pause here um, before answering um, any more questions. We'll move on just to keep the pace of the talk tonight. Um, but do remember that I will get back to all of the questions. Um, and at the very least, I will stay afterwards and answer any questions that did not get answered throughout the talk. So, um, as a side note, before we jump into the good stuff for tonight, talking about the beneficial insects that you all are here to learn about, um, I also wanted to remind you that it's not just the um, insects that are doing nature's work for you in the garden. Um, birds, bats, frogs, snakes, and lizards are all helping to control pest problems in your garden as well. Um, the birds, a lot of times people um, get frustrated, like they'll go, you'll, they'll, you'll see the blue jays and everything like that um, going into the garden. And yes, they may pick a tomato or two, um, but a lot of times what they're doing is they're hopping around in the soil and they're digging with their beaks and scratching um, to find bugs in the soil. Um, so they're definitely doing us a service there, even though they may create those little craters. Um, frogs are another great one, um, or toads. Um, you can create a little toad home by taking um, an overturned pot that has um, just like a slight, like broken, old broken pots or anything like that. Anything that they have like a small area or a gap to squeeze under, it helps keep them moist um, and gives them a little hideaway um, that's nice and dark. Um, that can definitely help support toads in your, your garden. And they eat all sorts of insects. And especially the lizards to the anoles um, and everything like that they're working hard i've seen them eat all sorts of bugs not necessarily like small soft-bodied insects like aphids but they will eat beetles they will eat i've i've seen them eat cockroaches half the size of them <laughs> they will eat all sorts of pests um, so definitely something to encourage um, most of these are going to need um, slightly undisturbed or unkept areas in the garden, places that they can hide during the day. Uh, low ground covers are really good um, for snakes and lizards um, and frogs and toads. Also having a water source around is a really good idea. Um, whether it's like the, the st stacked stones we were talking about or a bird bath or anything like that. Um, those are all really important for these helpful, um, helpful guys in the garden. All right, so we are going to jump into it. Um, like I said, I'm going to be showing the larval and the adult stage of the um, insects that we're going to be talking about tonight. We'll discuss um, the prey that they're um, best known for controlling, although a lot of them will do uh, more than um, what I have listed. I'll also talk about how to help support them and um, 
entice them into the garden, uh, make it as friendly as possible. And then we'll also talk about lookalikes. Now, some of these are pretty identifiable, but there's also ones that are a little tricky. Um, so let's take um, our, first, our first one, a uh, really well-known beneficial insect in the garden, and that's ladybugs. Um, so a lot of people know what a ladybug looks like on the right, but um, this is its larval stage on the left and clearly looks completely different. Both of them are ferocious aphid eaters. Any sort of soft-bodied insects, scale, mites, um, white flies, uh, any soft-bodied insect that is in your garden, these guys will go to town on. Um, the larval form actually eats more aphids than the adult form. So um, definitely both of them are wonderful to have in and around the garden. Um, there are not so many lookalikes for the larval stage. A lot of people just don't realize that's a ladybug, so um, they might kill it or try to kill it. Um, but there's not too many other insects that look like they do. But uh, a lot of people don't realize ladybugs, the adult form on the right, actually has a lot of lookalikes. Um, one is the Asian lady beetle, um, which isn't necessarily like a pest that's going to prey on your plants, um, but they can be aggressive. They can bite. Um, they have a really strong odor if they're squished um, and they excrete like a yellow substance. Those are also the ones that will um, go into your house um, and, and go in the corners in hibernation. If you're from North Florida, um, you may have experienced that before. Um, so although they're not going to be damaging your garden, those are a lookalike to be aware of. Also the Mexican bean beetle or squash beetle. And those are two you definitely want to look out for. Um, they will actually, they're, they, are, they are eating your plants. Um, clearly squash and beans um, are their primary um, food sources, what they go to most often, or those in the same family. Um, so squash is in the cucurbit family, which means it does um, like squash, watermelon, cucumbers, those are all in the same family. Um, so you could potentially see a squash beetle on any of those crops. Mexican bean beetle, beans are in the legume family, which means um, beans and peas, cow peas, that kind of thing. Um, so those are definitely ones to be aware of. Uh, the Mexican bean beetle is kind of like a yellowish orangey color. So um, at first glance, you'll think, oh, it's a ladybug. Um, but once you look closer, they also have a difference um, in their spot pattern. Um, and the little piece that's kind of behind the head is different as well. Um, so if you have any doubts, um, go ahead and look up the pictures on that one and compare. Um, but it's just something to be aware of that there are several lookalikes for ladybugs. Um, so this is a good uh, time to hop over. I'll see um, about answering a couple of questions before moving on. Like I said, if we get too backed up, I will um, hold the questions until the end. All right, um, so Lori asked, what if the garden consists only of containers? How do you control the bugs? My biggest problem is with the squash family. Squash are tough to grow here. To be quite honest, I only grow to, um, seminal pumpkin pretty much. Every once in a while, I'll grow like a tatumi. Um, that's the only other squash that I've had good success with. Um, also, Alexandria is another good squash variety. Um, but they have a lot of pests. They're very susceptible to molds and mildews, so there's a lot that can go wrong with them. Um, so let's see here. I'm gonna hold off on that, um, Sophia, and talk about that at the end. I'll see if there's anything directly related to ladybugs before moving on. And um, like I said, I will go back and answer questions afterwards. All right. Um, Okay, so we talked about that, Sarah, the squash beetle from the ladybug. Um, I didn't do pictures of the lookalike bugs. Um, I guess I should have, I can, um, but this should give you a starting point. So um, like I said, with the ladybugs, you're gonna be looking for that um, different spot pattern and more of a yellowish orange tint to them. Um, if you're, if you're, questioning it, look it up. 
Um, and I already typed it once into the chat box. I'll send out the link directly to their search page. But IFIS Extension Center is really good for identifying um, whether it's a friend or a foe. And I, they actually have a little book that's all Florida-based um, bugs as well that you can kind of flip through and it's like a little chart that you can reference. Um, that's like kind of like a quick cheat cheat type thing. All right, so it looks like we got those answered. <laughs> uh, so tonight's talk is gonna be focusing on the good guys, not the bad guys. I do or have done in the past a pest management class that focuses more on the bad guys, how to identify them and how to treat them. Um, but tonight we are going to be focusing on the good guys and what they can do for us in the garden. Um, that is a great question, Barb, and that will segue right into uh, our next slide, our next beneficial insect. Barb asked, should I buy ladybugs online? In most cases, no. Um, so they clearly fly, uh, and if they don't have a sufficient food source, um, they will fly away. If it's not to their liking, they're gonna leave the area and find something that is. Uh, not only that, but a lot of them are collected during hibernation. So when you release them, it's like them waking up. So they're not in that, I found food, I'm staying mode. They're in the, I just woke up, time to go look for food mode. Um, so sometimes they stay, sometimes they don't. And unless you have a heck of a problem on your hands, more often than not, they're gonna just quickly leave the area. Uh, so ladybugs are not one that I recommend purchasing and putting into the garden. Although there are two that if you're thinking about it, um, will be much more likely to stick around for you. Um, Lori asked how to um, attract the ladybugs. Um, we just covered why they probably left, but um, as far as attracting them to the garden, uh, the adults will actually eat um, nectar and pollen um, from flowers if there are not enough aphids around or meat. Um, so having um, those sources around are really helpful for keeping them in the area until you do have a problem. So their, their primary target is those soft-bodied insects, but if they aren't around, they will, um, as long as there's sufficient flowers and nectar, they will go to those and wait around for the aphids. But if there's no flowers, then they're going to jump ship and find somewhere that does have a food source. Um, and the extra floral nectaries are plants that have a additional nectar sources beyond just the flower bloom. And a lot of crops have those. Sunflowers, elderberry, there's a lot of native plants and um, um, ornamental plants that you can plant that all have those. And that basically means that they're gonna be able to find nectar off of that plant when it's not in bloom, which is um, clearly very helpful um, so that it's a constant source instead of just you know once in a while when it does bloom. All right so um, the next one is lace wings and if you are considering purchasing a good bug online this would be one of my two recommendations for doing so. Um, they can fly um, but they're not great flyers and when they're shipped to you they're actually the larval form which is on the left here um, and they're not um, they don't fly at all at that point. So lace wings can be a great one to purchase online if you are thinking about that. Uh, they pretty much eat everything that ladybugs eat, um, but they will also take out small caterpillars, which ladybugs will not do. Um, so they could potentially even help more than the ladybugs. Um, they are really good to have around. Um, you can help have them in the garden again by um, having flower sources. The adults will sometimes eat um, bugs, but their primary source is actually flowers, whereas the um, larval stage is definitely a carnivore. Uh, the other thing is they lay, the lace wings lay their eggs um, on these like silky threads um, that kind of stick up off the underside of a leaf. And they, it looks like there's almost like a drop of water at the end. That's the lacewing egg. You'll typically see them in a cluster or a line on the underside of the leaves. So 
leaving those undisturbed um, is clearly, you know, ideal. You're, you're allowing the eggs to live and thrive. Um, so that is definitely one um, to consider when, instead of like, you know, constantly brushing through the garden and um, disturbing the plants, um, you know, only go in and be selective and, and get the crop you need instead of um, disturbing the entire plant because um, they may have um, eggs there. All right. Um, let's see. Hillary said they often lay on my windows. Um, the ladybugs or they, the lace wings. Um, are they related to a termite? No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, they kind of do look like it a little bit. Um, longer, longer um, body though, much, much longer than the termite. Um, all right. Oh, the lace wing eggs on your windows. That's fun. I don't think I've ever seen that. You must have a happy habitat for them there. That's great. All right, um, so as far as lookalikes, there aren't too many other um, pests in the garden that do look like them. Um, I will say that they have a brown and a green variety here in Florida, so uh, it could potentially look just like this, but have more of a brown and white modeling pattern to them rather than the green. Um, but like I said, this is going to be giving you guys the general look and the concepts, and then um, when you see it, You'll just do a quick search on the phone or come reference the slides um, and you can go for there, go from there and confirm that it really is the bug you're looking at. All right, so here's my little buddy that I just couldn't kill um, for that project, the praying mantis. And this is one of the most easily identifiable beneficial insects in the garden. Uh, there are a ton of different varieties. Um, they actually are another really good, that's one of the other common um, beneficial insects that you can purchase and have mailed to you. I've actually done it once. Um, I didn't buy the eggs myself, but um, a friend had a young son and he had gotten them for his son to experience in their garden. And they sent him something like, I don't know, a thousand eggs or something like that. And clearly he didn't need that for a small garden. So he gave me the extra eggs and I hatched them out and it was just, it was really fun. Um, to see them go about the garden. They will actually eat themselves. So, you know, you might start with 500 and you'll end up with, depending on how large your space is and how much food there is for them, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20, maybe 50, depending on how large your space is, but really, really cool um, insects to watch in the garden. So the other ones we were talking about, um, we're more focused in on the smaller stuff, the soft bodied stuff. These guys, will take care of your larger pests in the garden. Um, so they will eat some of the soft bodied insects, but they're much more focused on the larger prey. Um, that's what those, those um, ninja arms are for. They catch their prey. Um, they're kind of barbed underneath their, their forearms there, and it helps them to catch and hold on to their prey. Um, they actually eat their prey alive. They're not venomous or poisonous or anything like that. So there's no you know, spider bite where it kills the prey and they eat it later, um, they actually eat it alive. So those barbs help hold the insect while they start eating. Um, they will eat grasshoppers, all sorts of different beetles, crickets, um, and like I said, even each other. Uh, so they will pretty much eat anything that moves um, or that they have a shot at. With that being said, they're really cool and chill with people. Um, unless you're like being aggressive to it um, or, you know, hurting it in some way or something like that. They'll crawl right on your hands. Um, they're very docile um, and no issues to have if you if you know you have a garden with children or anything like that. Um, there's no issue whatsoever with these guys. Um, one of the beneficial insects that we will talk about um, does have a bite and a sting and it hurts. <laughs> um, but these guys, praying mantis, are good to go. Um, all right, so let's hop on over. Uh, so yes, Susan, there are ones for white flies. Um, we'll talk about that um, and I'll specify the, the ones that are good for that. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, 
Jason, uh, I'm praying they'll eat army caterpillars. The praying mantis will eat any caterpillars they find. So uh, don't have to pray on that one. Uh, if they find them, they will eat them. Uh, Lori asked, are they native to Florida or are they all over Florida or just north or south Florida? They're, I, I don't know the exact number. I used to be really pretty fascinated with them and knew um, in more detail. But there are probably 10 to 20 different species, um, different colors, sizes, all sorts of different things that are native to Florida um, and the southeastern United States. Um, they're found all over the place. So um, north, central, south Florida. Um, I actually had one jump on me in the Keys once. Um, so yeah, they're all over the place. Um, uh, so Franklin asked, um, larval insects are carnivores and omnivorous because they need so much protein to develop the carapace for adults. Um, in general, they're, yeah, they're just like kids. Um, so they're going through a lot of development during that time and a lot of growth. Um, so yes, a lot of the larval forms are carnivorous for that extra boost. Okay, multiple questions here. Um, so adults will look for sugars and carbs to keep themselves fueled and active for the remainder of their lifespan. In general, not, but all insects are different and they all have different feeding styles. Um, but that is an easy source for pollinators. It's absolutely used for energy, even honeybees. Um, that, that is stored food for them. Um, so it's, it's sugar, yeah, for sure. Um, insects for the Insects with nymph forms tend to maintain their feeding habit the whole lifespan through instead. I'm not sure I understand that. Um, no, it's all good, Franklin. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm not sure I understand your last question though. So if you wanna retype it, I will move on and then we'll come back to it on the, after the next slide. All right, so the next one we are going to talk about tonight is dragonflies. And I just want to check we're doing good on time. Okay. Uh, I wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. If you need to log off, I want to make sure we're done by 10. So dragonflies, uh, we may or may not think of as beneficial insects in the garden, um, but if you have any sort of water source around, um, they are wonderful to have around the garden. One, they eat mosquitoes, which we were already talking about earlier. Um, they eat a tremendous amount of mosquitoes. If you have your dragonflies during the day and bats at night, you will be good to go. Um, but they will also eat other flying insects like the lace, um, lace wings, <laughs> um, like the um, white flies we were talking about um, and other flying insects. Um, so definitely good to have around. Um, their main requirement or their main need is some sort of pond feature. Um, and this can't be, like I was talking about different water sources to help support the good guys in the garden. Um, you know, rocks catching condensate isn't gonna cut it for these guys. Um, they will need a, um, a pond or um, some sort of, if you live near, you know, um, one of the drainage ditches or anything like that, they will need a significant water source um, to be in the area. Um, all right, as far as lookalikes, um, they don't have very many lookalikes. Um, everybody knows the adult form, the larval form or the nymph form um, clearly looks a lot different than the adults, um, but not too much to worry about. The larval form, um, just so you know, they eat a ton of mosquitoes and mosquito larvae. They are only in the water. Um, as their larval form. They don't um, leave the water until they develop into the dragonfly. Um, all right. So, oh wait, hold on. I didn't mean to click that. All right, sorry. All right, so we have a few questions pop up before we move on. Um, let's see, insect larvae is one. Hold on, sorry, I'm gonna scroll up the chat feature it like jumps down when there's questions. Um, mantises have nymphs instead of pupae and larvae. They are carnivores the whole life through. Same with roaches and grasshoppers. It was meant to be a statement comparing the insects with nymphs to the insects with larvae. How one tends to have a static diet while the later has a variety. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
Hillary damselfly versus dragonfly um, looks. Um, they have slightly different feeding habits um, and requirements, but very similar. Um, Courtney, do they tolerate brackish water? Um, I've seen them near brackish water, but I, and this is a, um, an assumption, but I do think they need a fresh water source um, unless it's really brackish. Um, I don't think they can rely solely on brackish water. Um, Brooke, do you keep a pond for only the good guys and keep mosquitoes out? Um, I don't have a pond at my house. Um, I used to when I was growing up and we had um, fish in there, which would maintain the mosquitoes. Also moving water, um, the moving water mosquitoes don't um, really thrive in. Um, so between that and the beneficial insects, um, it easily um, takes care of any mosquitoes that could potentially um, lay their eggs in the pond. All right. Um, so we will move on now to spiders. Um, I actually had a um, student uh, reach out, uh, I don't know, maybe last week or the week before, and they had a little jumping spider um, asking if it was okay. And, you know, all I could say with that is, um, all spiders eat bugs, um, but all spiders um, do bite, you know, um, or they are potentially um, poisonous. So, um, you know, even daddy long legs, everybody thinks, you know, daddy, the only reason um, they aren't a quote unquote threat to people is their mouth is too small to bite us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so all, all spiders technically do have that you know, risk, um, but they're wonderful to have around the garden. They do a really good job of helping to control insects. Um, they all have very different forms of hunting. Um, so I just picked the orb weaver and the jumping spider. Both are pretty common around here. The orb weaver weaves a web um, and catches insects in the web and then will eat them from there. The jumping spider um, actually uses a single thread that it drops down with. Um, when it's hunting. Um, so it's much more like an ambush active hunting strategy, whereas the orb weaver is waiting for things to pass by. So a lot of different strategies for hunting, but um, in general, they're going to be eating smaller bugs, um, flying insects. That's what those webs are really good at catching. Um, so how can we help them in the garden? We can let them be. We can leave their webs up. Um, the other thing that's um, pretty helpful is having either tall plants or my, I have this orb weaver, um, my dog and my daughter um, inevitably walk through the poor little spider's web every few days, but keeps on rebuilding on my tomato cages. He spans my two beds and has his web between the two tomato cages. So tall structures help them um, form their webs above the ground, which is where they often like to be. Um, and when it's right there in the center of the garden, whether it be from tomato cages or tall plants like okra, um, planted close together so they can weave their web in between there, trellises, anything like that um, are helpful. Um, also ground cover. So um, like I said, the jumping spiders are um, not going to be weaving those webs, but they all need to hide out from birds and the like during the day. Um, so the more cover um, that we can offer them, the better. Um, as far as spiders, I didn't, I put none um, just because a spider is a spider is a spider. Um, there's not too much that looks like them, although they all do look completely different from each other. Um, so just in general, um, that is something um, to think about. Um, Mary, example of ground covers. Um, if you want edible ground covers, you can do things like sweet potatoes, cow peas, um, New Zealand spinach. Uh, let's see, oxalis is pretty low growing. Um, <laughs> purslane is a lower growing. It's more of like a spindly though, so it's not so good with the ground cover. Longevity spinach, Okinawan spinach, all of these are edible ground covers. Um, if it's near the garden, not necessarily in the garden, um, any sort of low crawling ground cover, so ivy or um, 
some of the grasses, sunshine mimosa, um, anything that's going to be sheltering near the soil line is ideal. Um, so those are all examples of um, ground cover. Uh, what are your thoughts on mosquito bit product? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that one, Courtney. Bits, um, if you could elaborate. Um, all right, Danielle asks, spiders also love yarrow feathery leaves. Yeah, so yarrow is a wonderful insectary plant um, to have in the garden. Um, the feathery leaves, but also for as a pollen and nectar attractor, also anything in the carrot family. So a lot of the um, fragrance um, herbaceous plants that we often plant in the garden. Um, anything with the umble like um, heads where it's flowers with very small um, small flowers at the tip. So it, it looks like one big flower, but really it's a bunch of small flowers. Those are really good for beneficial insects in the garden and pollinators. Um, Beth, spiny orb weavers are my favorite spiders. I know they're really cool. I, um, I, I like them a lot too. They're just fun and fascinating to watch and I like how they all look a little bit different too. Um, all right, so let's move on. Um, we were talking about the assassin bugs. That was the, um, I was talking to a few folks before the class started, um, and they said, how can you identify an assassin bug versus stink bugs and that kind of thing? And I wanna draw your attention to their sucking mouth parts. So if you look, um, even on the, um, the nymph stage or the larval stage, um, you're going to see the, the, the large sucking mouth part. Um, and that's fairly distinctive. Um, also a lot of the colorations, um, you can see here like the wheel bug that has the distinctive like semicircle on top of its, its back. Um, that's pretty distinctive for telling it apart. Um, wheel bugs are pretty common around here. I have them all over in my garden. Um, what do assassin bugs eat? They eat caterpillars, grasshoppers, um, flies, larger insects in general, um, but they are mobile and um, they're called an assassin bug for a reason. So they're really good hunters. Um, so they can catch mobile prey, things that fly, no problem. Um, they basically suck the insides out of them. So a little bit gruesome. Um, these guys, you do have to be cognizant. Um, they are not aggressive by any means, but um, they do have a pretty painful bite. Um, they use a poison to poison their prey when they're eating it um, so that they can then suck the insides out. Um, clearly they would not be able to do that with us, but um, their bite is quite painful. Um, but like I said, they are not aggressive. I have them all over my garden. My daughter is in the garden with me. Um, they really have to be harassed um, to bite you. Um, you have to be handling them, bumping them around, trying to squish them. Um, and it's more of a defense than anything. They're not looking at you as a, you know, a target or a prey item or anything like that. But it is something to be aware of because not fun. <laughs> um, so how can we help them? Um, they don't need a heck of a lot. They're mobile. Um, they're going to be able to find what they need in your environment in most gardens. Um, so I would just say um, giving them room and letting them do their job. Um, what, what was it yesterday? They were on my tomatoes um, and I had a bunch of the babies that had just hatched. There was probably 20 of them on my tomato plants um, and I was going to harvest that day and I was like, yeah, I'll just let them be. I'll let them do their thing, scour the plant and I'll come back tomorrow and they'll all be dispersed. So giving them some room and letting them do their thing. Um, uh, Lookalikes. Um, it's more in um, North Florida, not so prevalent at all um, in South Florida, not even really in Central Florida, but they have had um, records of the kissing bug, um, which does potentially look like um, the assassin bugs. Um, they're, they also bite um, quite painful um, and they can carry diseases um, and they are more aggressive than the assassin bug people. Uh, so definitely not one to have um, around. Um, I don't, I, I should have done and I did not do pictures of the lookalikes. Um, somebody else asked about that earlier, Katie, um, and that was just, um, it would have been a good idea. 
So my apologies on that. Um, but at least this will get you started um, so that you know if you think you have an assassin bug, look up kissing bug, you'll be able to easily compare it um, picture wise using IFIS extension. Um, all right, so um, I think we're caught up on questions. So we will move into the solitary beetles uh, or beetles, <laughs> bees. Uh, solitary bees are the ones that you see those little um, homes for that you can buy. Like, I mean, you can even get them at Earth. I saw at Earth Fair, not that it's open anymore, but um, they even had them there for sale. And it's when you see like those little, basically like birdhouses with straws in them kind of a thing. Um, those are for solitary bees. Um, some of them live in hollowed out tubes like that um, or in, you know, wood that's kind of rotted away or woodpecker holes or whatever the case may be. They'll live in those tubes. Some of the solitary bees also like to live in the sand. Um, and that is one thing that we'll talk about in a second. But as far as what they eat, um, primarily uh, they will eat pollen and nectar. Um, but there are several solitary bee species that will feed um, their young um, dead bugs. Uh, so they will um, find, kill, and bring their, um, their young bugs so that when they hatch, um, they have a food source ready for them. Um, so that's one reason why it's technically in the beneficial insect. Of course, the pollination is tremendous. Um, and most of these species are natives native bee species, which is very important to support, um, but they are also beneficial for controlling um, pests in the garden, although that's not their primary function. Um, there are a ton of different species and varieties. These are just an, a, a few, um, but there are tons of them out there. In general, um, most of these bees are non-aggressive, um, they, half of them don't even sting. Most of the males don't even have stingers. Very, very non-aggressive. They don't have the honey and um, the resources that, you know, what we're used to with the um, honeybees. How we can help support them. Um, I referenced or alluded to the sandy area. So some of the solitary bees actually create, um, they're called ground bees, and they, they will tunnel into sands. So if you have a densely planted grassy lawn or mulch, um, they, they, they can't create their homes in that. So having even just a small area um, or a neighbor's yard, if their you know, your neighbor's house isn't looking, their yard isn't looking so good, that's probably fine too, especially in an urban setting. Um, but just sandy exposed areas is what they're going to make their home in. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Also the empty cavities like I was talking about and that's basically those tubes, those straws, those little holes, nooks and crannies that are naturally going to happen all over your property. Um, but you know if you see them don't necessarily take them down or if you want you can go out and buy one of those um, the uh, bee houses. Of course clearly since their primary um, food source is flowers, having lots and lots of flowers hopefully year-round which sometimes can be harder than you would imagine um, planting a year-round flower source. Um, so looking at perennials and definitely the bloom season and trying to overlap and have different flowers um, throughout the garden so that you have continual um, source of pollen and nectar for the bees. Um, and I put lookalikes, none. Most people are going to be comfortable differentiating a bee from a wasp. And really though, um, although I didn't talk about them tonight, wasps are beneficial in most cases. Um, they're predatory um, carnivores. So um, those can even fall into this category. Although most um, people are less likely to tolerate them being in the, in the area just because they can be aggressive and their bites can hurt. Um, but technically those are beneficial as well. Um, what are the best plants to attract, um, Lori asked, what are the best plants to attract bees to pollinate your vegetables and flowers? I don't see very many in my yard. Uh, so the more flowers, the better. In most cases, they're not too picky. Um, one that's a really, really hardy flower that's a native um, is tropical sage. Pollinators go nuts over it. Um, there's cosmos are another really popular one, um, very drought tolerance. 
Tithonia is a good one, Mexican sunflower, that's a larger flower. Um, any, any flowers that you can think of, whether they're native, whether they're a food crop, or whether they're just ornamental, um, they will be able to feed on. Um, some plants have more nectar in them than others. Drought can also affect the amount of nectar the flower is putting out. Um, so I think diversity is your best bet. Um, Danielle mentioned Biden's Alba. That's a medicinal one as well. That's, it's growing everywhere. A lot of people call it Spanish needle. Um, that's the little white um, flowers with yellow in the center. Um, those are wonderful to have around. It's one of the first flowers to come and bloom um, early in our winter, um, early, early spring, and the bees go nuts over it. Um, interestingly enough, it does have a decent amount of pollen, but the nectar is not super high in, in vitamins. Um, so it is a food source. It is not the best food source, but they do definitely appreciate having it around. I always leave, um, leave it growing in my yard, even though they have like little, you know, uh, needles um, that get stuck in socks and stuff. It's worth having that around in my opinion for sure. Um, let's see here. All right, so um, our last one, we are almost out of time tonight. So I wanna make sure that I am um, on schedule for everybody. We'll talk about this last one and wrap up for this evening. And then if there's any other questions, I will stay afterwards and make sure everybody's questions get answered. The last one that I wanted to do was hoverfly. Um, and hoverflies can look like a lot of different things um, that would potentially be considered a pest. Um, although indirectly, like I mentioned, wasps aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world, um, nor flies in most cases. But um, anyhow, Hoverflies, what they eat. Um, primarily, again, they're going to be going for the pollen and nectar, but they do also eat aphids. Um, so they are, um, the young are the ones that are carnivorous. Um, you can see in that middle picture there, um, they almost look like a slug, but they're not. Um, kind of clear bodied, um, but they definitely have um, the capability of taking down some aphids, which is always, always a good thing. Um, so this is kind of like a twofold. It's a pollinator for your garden as well as a beneficial predatory insect. How can we encourage them to be in our environments? We can have, once again, flowers, lots and lots of flowers. Um, we kind of highlighted some of the lookalikes there. Um, I will say hoverflies have more diversity than a lot of the other insects we were talking about tonight. Um, but they are a flying insect, which most gardeners don't have the capability of dealing with the same way as, you know, slow moving or soft bodied insects. So typically um, people aren't trying to chase off, you know, hoverflies quite as often as some of the other pests we mentioned tonight. Um, Safia asked, are they also called yellow jackets? No. So that's one of the lookalikes. Um, it's made, um, not made. It has you know, looked over time, it has developed the same look as a yellow jacket or a wasp, um, but that is a deterrent. Um, they have no stinger and uh, they are not the same thing. Um, so we were talking about white fly predators. The lace wing is good with um, white flies. So that's a good one to have around for that. Um, I had highlighted that then. All right, um, so if all else fails, I like to encourage people to use a deterrent rather than a pesticide. Just because even organic pesticides can linger in the environment, or even if you're spraying, um, you may not see the larval form hiding under a leaf or the passing, you know, adult form that is trying to do good work for you. Um, so I really encourage everyone to try to use deterrents rather than pesticides. Um, this is a homemade um, pest deterrent. Uh, I was talking to somebody prior to the start of this class about um, using a pest deterrent. This is the recipe I use. You can make it at home. It can be used on flowers, vegetables, anything like that. Basically, it's making it um, super garlicky and spicy so that it's not appetizing for the caterpillars or whatever else is munching away on your crops. Um, pretty easy to make. Um, there's a few different methods for it. Some people will boil it first. Some people um, 
will just go straight to the blending sage. I've done both. Um, I will say that if you do boil it, um, do it outside, it can get pretty pungent with all of those oils. Um, Basically, you're making this spray, um, and the other thing to do um, or note is putting a few drops of dish soap. That's not, um, soapy water can kill insects. That's not the purpose of this, and you're using it in such small quantities that if it were to come in contact, um, in most cases, it's not going to kill the bug. Um, this is a few drops um, because basically what soap does is it emulsifies oils. That's why when you add dish soap to your dishes, it the water is able to clean the grease. It's, it's allowing the oil and water to mix and release. So um, just a couple of drops of dish soap is all you need for this recipe. Um, all right, so I'll hold the neem until the end just so anybody who does need to check out can do so. Um, like I mentioned before, I do weekly um, tutorials on Florida-based vegetable gardening on YouTube. Um, so go ahead and subscribe to the channel and I cover a wide variety of topics. Um, composting, um, summer vegetables to grow in your Florida garden, um, heirloom tomato varieties that grow well, all sorts of different topics. Um, so make sure to check that out. Um, if you're looking to get started in vegetable gardening, I also do a seed club as well, um, where I mail three varieties of in-season seed to your door once a month um, so that you can get a, a feel for the seasons like we were talking about, you know, right plant, right place type of thing. Um, it helps, um, helps expose you to new varieties and kind of get you in the swing of the seasons. Um, and I also have a ton of resources online as far as reading lists for books that I found helpful, um, different recommended products. Um, somebody just asked about neem oil, things like neem oil are on there, um, all sorts of different things like that. So um, make sure to check out the website as well if you um, have any additional um, questions or information you're looking for. Uh, so that wraps up tonight. Like I said, this will be recorded or this was recorded. Um, so I'll be sending it out um, tomorrow so that everybody has access to it. Um, and you can download it or do whatever you need with it so that you have it for reference at a later point. Um, but for now, I will hop back over and finish answering any questions. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I hope this was beneficial and informative. If I teach it again, I will certainly take um, the input for the look-alike pictures. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have those. I do think now that you asked for them that that would have been helpful. Um, but um, enjoy your evening and um, I will hop back up and finish those last questions. Alrighty, so let's see here. Neem oil, that was where we were. Is neem oil considered a pesticide? Yes. Um, it affects the hormone systems um, of the, neem is a touchy subject. I use it very rarely. Um, I use it as my like final, final last resort. They say it is only, it only affects bad bugs, but I just, I don't see how that's possible. Um, but the research indicates that it um, only affects bad bugs. Um, and it, it disrupts their hormone system. So it's not a kill on contact. Um, typically neem is going to mess up their um, feeding habits or their reproductive habits. Um, so it's like a slower effect. Um, it is organic. It's derived from um, neem tree or, you know, um, neem oil. That's where it's from. Um, so it is an organic product. I will use it very rarely um, and as a last resort. Um, Katie asked, what are your thoughts on BT spray for caterpillars and pickle worms? Um, BT is, for those who don't know, it's, I always say it's slightly incorrect, Basilicus thorogenesis, I believe. Um, and it's basically a beneficial bacteria um, that you can spray. Um, it's very effective against um, caterpillars um, and like she mentioned, the pickle worms and a few other pests. Um, it's very effective. Um, I would use that before neem um, just because in most cases it's very targeted. Um, but, I, and I should have said this earlier because I think a lot of people have logged off, but it's always important to keep in mind that, you know, those are 
butterflies and moths, um, which have their own function in nature. So, you know, sometimes unless the crop is going to be completely annihilated, like, you know, if you've got squash, they're so susceptible and they just like that, they're gone. You know, if, you, if you're having squash problems or whatever, and you're going to lose the entire crop, then treat. You, you can use the BT, but it's, it is throwing off that balance in nature. So it's just, it's something to be aware of when you take those kinds of steps. Um, that is certainly way less toxic and way more targeted than most other pesticides. So in that way, yes, I do use it, um, but it is tipping the scale and intervening. So something to be considered. All right, let's see here. Uh, lots of, um, and Katie asked for the website. I will send it out um, with a recording as well, but it is UF, University of Florida Extension. Um, it's IFAS, I-F-A-S. Um, and they have a wonderful entomology resource there. All right, so let's see if there were any other questions. Lots of thank yous. I'm glad it was helpful for everybody. All righty. Um, what will take care? We have one question. Um, uh, the worm miners, I believe you mean leaf miners, the one that leaves the little trails in the leaves, like little white trails and squigglies. Um, leaf miners are pretty much purely cosmetic. They don't affect the yield or growth of the plant really at all. Uh, I don't, I don't treat for them. I don't, I don't do anything for them. It really bugs um, some people, um, especially beginner gardeners. But um, so if you want to, you can, especially if they're not on all the leaves, you can nip off the leaf that you see the trail in and toss the leaf. Um, but really it's, it's, it's just a superficial thing. So you don't need to worry about losing your crop or anything like that. All right, let's see. What was the name of the spider with the red crown? I have them all over the inside of my pool cage. Um, those are orb weavers. Yeah, they're really, really common here in Florida. They're pretty cool little guys. Um, and they do a pretty good job uh, of taking care of things. I've never really seen them, you know. And they're, they're also not like creepy crawly, like some of the other spiders or whatever you'll find in the, I don't, I just don't find them in the house or anything like that. Um, they're really pretty cool and chill chill little spiders. I let, I have them all over my yard. All right, let's see. Anybody else? Sarah, Elise, I'm Googling ladybugs versus squash beetles versus Mexican bean beetles. I found several yellowish orange ladybugs looking things on my cucumber plant. I thought they were ladybugs, but now I'm questioning it. Having a hard time finding the best way to tell the three apart. Yeah, so um, it has to do with the number of spots and whether it's on both sides of the wing or one side of the wing. Um, and then that, that coloration is another distinct one. Um, if they're on your cucumber plants, it's quite likely um, that it's a squash beetle. Um, you can try taking a picture of it. You can um, send it to IFAS extension and they'll actually um, identify the pest for you. Or if you ever have like a plant you don't know or anything like that, they'll identify it for you. Um, there should be some pretty clear cut resources um, that'll show you the way the, the spots line up on the wings. Um, that should help you figure out whether it's a squash beetle or um, a ladybug. So yeah, and, and going on IFAS's website might help because um, there's always, there's blogs and all sorts of stuff, but they may not be very specific. I like IFAS because they're, they, it's easy to understand, but it's scientific based. So it's going to tell you this is what you look for type of thing rather than a, yep, it could be this or that type of thing. So um, hopefully that helps, Sarah. And good to hear from you. I haven't seen you guys in so long with all these classes being out. I hope all is well. Um, all right, Vanessa, how should we spray um, neem if it's used? Is there a limit? Yeah, you follow the package instructions. Um, 
uh, it's diluted greatly. So like uh, when you purchase a bottle of neem oil, um, you're usually going to be doing like a capful per like gallon or two of water. So very diluted, um, depending on the brand and everything like that. Um, with any sort of um, sprays, um, always spray in morning or late evening. You don't want to spray during the heat of the day. The oils in a lot of these um, sprays can affect the plants and burn the plants. Um, so yeah, um, you if you're using it though, be very thorough because like I said, you want to try to get rid of as many if not all of the pests, which like I said, you're never going to get rid of all of them. But um, if you're doing it, do it so that you can actually handle the situation rather than, you know, it's like when you have antibiotics and you take, you know, the first three days and then you feel better, you got to finish taking it because <laughs> otherwise uh, it's going to come right back and bite you in the butt. So if you're going to, if you choose to use neem oil or any sort of other intervention, um, make sure to follow the directions and follow it through. Uh, what's a good safe pesticide that won't harm caterpillars? Uh, well, it depends on what you're doing. Um, none. Um, most pesticides are going to not be very specific. Um, caterpillars happen to be one that are very susceptible. They're soft-bodied. Um, most pesticide, pesticides will affect them. Um, if you're concerned about them, you can remove them from plants and do like that sacrifice plot that I was talking about in the beginning um, so that you can feed them and let them grow into the beautiful butterflies and moths that they were meant to be without losing your food crops. Um, or you can just let Mother Nature handle that balance for you. All right. Uh, Val says, my friend sprinkles cayenne pepper on the leaves like dust, says it works for her, but I'm afraid of the acidity or changing the plant. You don't have to worry about acidity, um, but they will, it will wash off um, with rain, which we're heading into the rainy season. Um, so it, it will, it's perfectly fine to use. I think it's better in drier climates than here. Um, the hot pepper spray tends to stick a little bit better. Um, just because of that oil and, and, and soap mixture, um, I find that it, it lasts a little bit longer. But if we do have any sort of heavy rain, you will have to reapply the, um, the spray as well. I'm glad it was helpful, Jennifer. It was good to see you tonight. Um, or realize that you were here. I guess I didn't see you. But all right. Um, Barb, I've stopped all pesticide spray in my large flower garden, but still have the lawn spray and I'm feeling guilty. It's, you know, a lot of us, especially living in um, urban settings, there, there's, I mean, if you're in a homeowner's association, you literally just don't have much of a choice. But with that being said, there are um, companies out there that use more organic um, methods. I don't use any um, I don't mow my lawn. I don't have a lawn, um, but I do know that there are a few companies out there that um, use at least organic pesticides um, so that hopefully the toxicity isn't um, as lasting. So maybe researching one of those options. Um, and, you know, I always like to support people because, you know, every little change you make is a change for the better and none of us are perfect and none of us are going to have everything right. Um, not you, not me, not anybody. So um, we do what we can with what we have and we make the best of it. Um, all right. So Katie, I'm having major squash and cucumber issues. <laughs> yeah, it's that time of year. Um, so the entire cucurbit family, um, squash, cucumbers, watermelon, they are all um, very, very finicky when it comes to humidity and heat. Um, so they're very susceptible to mildews. Um, they also have a ton of pests, um, squash vine borers, all sorts of beetles. They are a tough crop to grow here. I would say harder than tomatoes by a long shot. A lot of people say they can't grow tomatoes in Florida. I'm more partial to squash. They're a pain in the butt. Um, so don't feel like it's you. It's just a really tough crop to grow here. You can absolutely do it. 
it takes a lot of effort. Um, doing floating row covers when the plants are seedlings um, really does help go a long way because it'll give the plants a jump start. Um, picking varieties that thrive better in our climate. I mentioned a few squash varieties, um, the Seminole pumpkin, Alexandria, Tatumi all grow really well here. Um, as far as cucumber, I really like the Ashley variety. Um, it grows really well. It's very heat tolerant. Um, so hopefully that can um, point you in the right direction. It's not so much solving so many of the issues now, but this is the tail, season, tail end of the season for them anyhow. Um, with the exception of Seminole Pumpkin, it grows through the summer, but, um, you know, it is, it's not, it's not you. <laughs> um, we have to respect the seasons. That's part of organic gardening. All right, let's see, oh, 34 new messages. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Leaf miners, cinnamon as a deterrent, um, it's just as effective as the cayenne. Um, it does pretty well. Um, any of these powdered forms, cayenne, cinnamon, diatomaceous earth, all of those um, get washed away in rains. And unfortunately, our heavy pest season is also our rainy season. Um, most of the time, I just don't bother because of that. But as far as their efficacy, if we are in a dry spell or a couple of days worth of dry, um, they can be effective. Um, okay, good, Sarah, okay. Um, where have you ordered the insects for uh, from online? Honestly, it's been years since I did. Um, I'll send it out in the show notes. There's a, um, research lab that I purchased them from. I do not purchase from any of those like, um, you know, like Amazon or anything like that. Um, I do usually go through the, um, the, the labs. Um, so I will send out the link for that. Um, and they, they'll do the lace wings and all of that. So um, all right, I will type in one more time and I will also have it in the recording notes. Um, but it's IFAS extension um, for the um, resource to look up um, what bugs. Okay. Thank you. Lots of thank yous. Plant squash earlier. Yeah, um, we in most cases don't get um, hard freezes. So yeah, definitely the earlier, the better. The, the pests are um, intensifies, the heat intensifies. So it's just like a twofold thing. Um, the earlier you, you plant them, the better. But with that being said, squash um, in general are more of a heat loving crop. They're just, they're finicky. <laughs> um, let's see. How long should I let my English cucumber get, Susan? Um, so it depends on the plant. Um, and the stress and the variety. Um, English cucumbers are usually um, probably a foot long or so, um, maybe a little bit longer. Um, it just depends on the variety though. So if you look at the seed packet that you purchased, um, it should give you a range um, and that's always a really good indicator. If there's any signs of yellowing or streaking on it, that usually indicates that it's ready for harvest. Um, so that's another sign. Alrighty, it looks like uh, we've got one more question. Franklin, I am not even sure what that is. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how to help you on that one. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Kim. Oh, oh, got you. Um, yeah, I've grown acacia. Um, it, they're also, I plant them more for the nitrogen aspect of things, but um, they are not necessarily native to here. I'm more of a permaculturist viewpoint, so I am um, open to non-invasive um, or easily controllable species that benefit the garden that are not necessarily native. So that's just something I'm comfortable with in the way I look at things, but um, 
Yeah. Um, all right. All right, so I think that looks like it is um, about it. I'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar for tonight. I'm glad it was helpful and we were able to get everybody's questions answered. Um, and like I said, I will send out the recording tomorrow. So have a beautiful evening and hopefully we will meet again.